We are going to begin our adventures in hypothesis testing using the most simple and basic statistical test. It's called a one sample Z test. It's a test that we can use when the standard deviation of the population is known. Let's start by examining what is a one sample Z test. A one sample Z test is a parametric procedure meaning that we are testing against a population parameter. It tests whether a sample mean is statistically significantly different than the population mean when the standard deviation of the population is known. Using our example with the polar bears, the population of polar bears walks an average of 100 miles per week with a standard deviation of 11 miles. Our sample of highly caffeinated polar bears walks an average of 150 miles per week. We can use this sample statistic to compare whether it is statistically significantly different than that population parameter. The research design for a one sample Z test works like this. We have a sample which is drawn from a population. This sample is one group, it's categorical. We also have a measurement of the population which tells us the mean and the standard deviation. The independent variable is that one sample. The sample has been randomly selected from the population. The dependent variable is scale level with a mean and both the mean and population standard deviation are known. Every statistical test is built on assumptions. There are four assumptions that we need to test for our one sample Z test. Number one, that there are no extreme outliers in our data set. If there are, we could remove or better yet, Windsorize those outliers. Number two, no missing data. If data are missing, we may need to impute that data. Independence. The dependent level data are independent of each other. No score in this data set is affecting other scores. And normality. The dependent variable data are normally distributed. If the dependent variable passes this check for normality, we are good to go. If the dependent variable does not past the check for normality, we need to make sure that we're using a large enough sample size that we can say that we have met the assumption of normality through the central limit theorem, that we have a large enough sample size that our distribution of sample means is normally distributed. Here are the statistical settings for our one sample Z test. We'll begin with a null hypothesis that the sample mean is the same as the population mean that they are no different. We would write our null hypothesis as h sub zero colon mu equals mu sub zero, in which mu sub zero is the population mean. In fact, what we will do is write mu equals, and then we will plug in the given population mean. Our alternative hypothesis would be written as h sub one colon mu does not equal mu sub zero, in which we will plug in that same value drawn from the population mean where you see the mu sub zero. The alpha level is typically set to 0 0.05. This gives us a critical value based on a normal distribution for a two-tailed test of 1.96 either positive or negative 1.96 if we were using a one-tailed test at an alpha of 0.05. The critical value would be either positive 1.645 if we were looking in the positive direction or negative 1.645 if we were looking in the lower direction. However, for all of these examples, unless you are directed otherwise, you could assume, especially for teaching purposes, that we are using an alpha of 0.05 two-tailed test. Let me give you the example that we're going to use for this research. I was looking around online and I found this very interesting bar chart. 
It's a Pareto chart. The scores have been arranged in ascending order. You notice that the scores are going sideways in this instead of up and down, but still it's easy enough to interpret. This is a bar chart of the average age of social network users on a variety of sites. Now, some of these sites I'm familiar with, others I've never heard of, like Bebo and Zanga and Hi5. But of course, those sites all have a much lower average age. I am familiar with Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn, but those sites have an older average age. And please, no speculation as to why I know the old sites and not the younger sites. The larger point is this. At the website Pingdom that did this research, they reported the average age of all social network users. And that average age was 36.9. The standard deviation of all of the social media users is 6.2. We have both the mean and the standard deviation of the population. Where did that standard deviation of the population come from, you may wonder? And the answer is, I made it up. In this example, we did not actually have a population value because that hasn't been measured. We did not have access to everyone in the population. But for this example, we're going to pretend that we have both the mean and the standard deviation. In most cases, that will not be true, and we will use a t-test instead. This is only being done for learning purposes. Let's take what we know and structure our research question. Researchers at the website Pingdom calculated the average age of users of social media websites and found that the average age of social network users in the United States is 36.9 years old, with a standard deviation of 6.2 years. This distribution is approximately normal. You obtain a sample of 25 users of the social networking site LinkedIn. The mean age for this sample is 40.2 years old. Is the average age of your sample of LinkedIn users different from the US population of social network users? And we're going to answer that question using our one sample z-test. Let's start with our research question and make some determinations. I want to move slowly through each step because this is the first test that we're learning. In future videos, we'll move more quickly through these steps. Let's review that research question. Is the average age of LinkedIn users different from the US population of social networking users? This research question is going to form up our alternative hypothesis. So we need to know, is this directional or non-directional? Have we established a direction of change, older, younger, or have we just said that there will be a difference without specifying in what direction? Because we did not specify a direction, this is a non-directional alternative hypothesis, and therefore we will use a two-tailed test as we test our null hypothesis for this research. And now we can begin working through the five steps of hypothesis testing. Step number one is to select the appropriate statistic. Based on the fact that we know both the mean and the standard deviation of the population, what test are we going to use? And the answer is whatever test we're learning this week. And that happens to be the one sample z-test. Of course, in the future, you're going to need to know how to recognize the research setup that would allow you to use this same one sample z-test. Let's go down to step two. We need to establish our null and alternative hypotheses. We can write our null hypothesis in either words or symbols. In words, we might say, LinkedIn user's age is no different than the average social media user. In symbols, we would write this as h sub 0 colon mu equals 36.9. And here you can see how I've taken the population mean of 36.9 
and plugged it in to our null hypothesis. I've already told you that we will be doing a two-tailed test. However, for this example, I want to show you how we would do both a two-tailed and a one-tailed alternative hypothesis. Let's start with a two-tailed alternative. In words, we would say that the LinkedIn user's age is different than the average user. And in symbols, we would write this as h sub 1 colon mu does not equal 36.9. If we were using a one-tailed test, we would specify a direction of change. We might write, LinkedIn users are older than the average user. And for symbols, we would write this as H sub 2. This is our second alternative hypothesis. Mu is greater than 36.9. However, when we specify a one-tailed alternative hypothesis, we're going to need to adjust our null hypothesis. If we're using an alternative that says greater than, the null hypothesis would be written as h sub 0 colon mu less than or equal to 36.9. Regardless of whether we are doing a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test, the equal sign will always stay with the null hypothesis. Now we're ready for step three. We will specify a level of significance, a criteria for how much evidence we require to determine statistical significance. And this determination will be made based on several factors, such as how many tails for our test. We're using a two-tailed test. What is our alpha level? We have set alpha equal to 0.05. For a two-tailed z-test with an alpha of 0.05, the critical value will always be positive or negative 1.96 because we are using a normal distribution of scores. Now that we've established the basic setup for our test using the first three steps of hypothesis testing, we're ready for step four, and that is we finally get to calculate a test statistic. We are going to do this first example by hand. Here is the formula for a z-test, and I want to draw your attention to the denominator of this formula. You see it is sigma over the square root of n, which is the standard error of the mean. You will sometimes see the formula for a z-test written with this standard error of the mean notation in the denominator but it is always the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And now we can do some math. We will begin by first calculating the standard error of the mean. We will plug in the values that we already know from our word problem. Sigma is 6.2, n is 25. And you can see why I chose 25, because it's much easier to get that square root. Do the math. 6.2 divided by 5 is 1.24. That is our standard error of the mean, which will be the denominator in our formula. The numerator is the difference between the sample mean and the population mean. Divide that difference by the standard error of the mean, and we get a z-score of 2.66. Congratulations! you have just done your first one-sample z-test, and you got a z-score of a positive 2.66. What are you going to do with that? We need to know how to interpret that z-score. And for that, we're going to move on to step five. We are going to interpret this test and reach a conclusion about statistical significance. For this example, I'm going to walk through much more slowly than I typically would. We're going to go back to basics so you can see exactly what we are doing. Let's start with a normal distribution. This distribution represents the distribution of sample means. All means from all possible samples of size 25. We have established a left and a right critical value based upon 1.96 standard deviations. This separates 
5% of the scores into the two tails, or 2.5% of the scores in each tail, with 95% of the scores in the body of the curve, probabilities greater than 0.05 exist within the middle of that curve. On the positive end, we have a z-score of 1.96 that we are going to use as our cutoff score or critical value. And we can add an x-axis with all of the means that we could possibly have calculated. We will add the mean of the population, which is 36.9, and would be represented by a z-score of 0. We actually observed a mean of 40.2, which we can see on our number line is over the fence of that critical value. It has a z-score of positive 2.66. It's in that purple region, which is the critical region or the region of rejection. Looking at that observed value and the critical value, we can make this determination. The observed value of z 2.66 exceeds the right critical value of positive 1.96. Therefore, this mean difference is statistically significant at p less than 0.05. Our very first test was statistically significant. We've made that determination, and now we are going to write up those results. Here's how I might write up this test in proper APA style. A study was conducted to determine whether users of the social networking website LinkedIn are significantly different in age than typical users of social networking sites. A one-sample z-test was used to compare the average age of a sample of 25 LinkedIn users, with a mean of 40.2, to the average age of social networking users, a mean of 36.9 and standard deviation of 6.2. LinkedIn users are significantly older than the typical social networking user. Z of 2.66, probability of 0 0.008, effect size of 0.53, reflecting the business and corporate focus of the site. We have now successfully walked through all five steps of hypothesis testing for a one-sample z-test. We've done this test by hand. Next, I'm going to show you how we can do a z-test using statistical software.